Why is the Blessed Virgin Mary sinless? I could go through the biblical data. I could talk about Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelion, how Satan and Mary should have perfect enmity. I could talk about how St. Luke positions Mary as the Ark of the Covenant. I could talk about the book of Revelation, chapter 12, the woman clothed the sun. We could do all those biblical arguments, and I've made, I don't know, probably six, seven videos covering all those topics, the theology, the church fathers, the Bible, the tradition on why the Virgin Mary is sinless. Today, we're not doing that. By the way, happy feast day, the Immaculate Conception. Today, Catholics on December 8th celebrate that Mary was conceived in her mother's womb without original sin and that she was full of grace her whole life, from the very moment she was saved by Jesus Christ, that original sin did not touch her. She never committed a mortal sin, venial sin. Her life was in perfect conformity with the Holy Spirit. Why was she sinless, though? Let's just talk about common sense. God is all holy. He is holy, holy, holy. Nothing unclean comes into his presence. The second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the eternal Logos, the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. You look at how careful God was in his instructions to Moses in just creating the Ark of the Covenant. Let's be honest, the Ark of the Covenant is a box. It's made out of acacia wood. It's overlined with gold. You can't touch it in the Old Testament or you die. Why was that important? It was a box that held the Ten Commandments. So that just reveals that when it comes to the tabernacle, we also could look in the book of Daniel and other prophets, how just even the sacred vessels, the chalices, the spoons, the, the platters, everything that was used at the temple was set apart and it was gravely sinful inappropriate. It was a desecration for them to be handled by anyone in a common way, right? They're set apart sacred. So knowing all that about God, you ask yourself the question, when God himself actually enters into history, into creation, why would God be any different? He chose one human person. Notice I didn't say human individual. I don't like the word individual. It's a communist Marxist word. Person. Christians talk about persons. We don't talk about individuals. You would never say the three individuals of the Holy Trinity. That's rubbish. He chose one person, a female, a woman, and he chose that one person person, call her Mary, to be the gateway, to be the portal, and even more, to be the mother of the Word made flesh. Now, God had some choices in front of him. He's all wise. He's all knowing. He can do whatever he wants. He's got, as long as he doesn't sin or go against reason, because he established those things. He could have said, you know what, to show my mercy and my solidarity with sinners, he could have chosen the most sinful woman who ever existed, a harlot, a prostitute, uh, a murderer. He could have chosen, we might say, the most defiled woman with the most defiled womb in the whole world and chosen her and used her to be the mother of our Lord. But That's not fitting with God's character, and particularly how you see how God is holy, 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 the all-holy in the Old Testament. He, of course, invites sinners to him, but he also has this aura of glory. So then God could have chosen maybe B, just the most average woman of all time, not terribly sinful, not terribly holy, just a woman who was just kind of the average of all women so that all women could identify 
with the mother of Jesus. He could have done that. Or at the opposite spectrum, so we have the most defiled, most sinful woman who ever lived, the most average woman, and then we have the most pure woman, the most holy woman, the woman who was always on God's team, always choosing the will of God, always listening to the movement and the voice of the Holy Spirit. Perfectly honored, and from her very first moment until the very end of her earthly life in the Dormition and then her bodily assumption, was totally attuned to God. I really think those were the three options. I mean, of course, there's God, there's so many options for God. But I mean, you just kind of think, okay, most sinful, average, most pure, most holy. Doesn't it make sense with the character of God? And I, I hope I'm talking to a lot of Protestants watch the Dr. Taylor Marshall podcast. Hello, Protestants. I used to be a Protestant minister. I was an Episcopalian priest before I became a Catholic in 2006. By the way, if, you're, if you are new, please like, please share, and please subscribe and hit that bell. Welcome to the Dr. Taylor Marshall podcast. Got a lot of people watching, not a lot of likes. Let's hit those likes. Talking to the Protestants. Doesn't that just make sense? I mean, we can talk about Bible. We can talk about church fathers and tradition, and, and Protestants are always going to lose that battle. I was a Protestant. I went toe-to-toe with Eastern Orthodox and Catholics, and we debated the Marian dogmas. And the Catholics always win that because we have the church fathers. We have the magisterium, and we have the scripture to back it up. But if you just bracket all that, doesn't it just make sense that the Word of God, the Son of God, the eternal Logos, the Alpha and the Omega, would honor his mother with the highest possible form of salvation. We believe Mary is saved. In Luke chapter 1, she talks about God, my Savior. But God saved her in the most perfect way from the very first moment of her conception. She was justified. She was sanctified. She was regenerated. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. She had the preternatural gifts. She had the supernatural gifts. She had the habit of original justice. I mean, she had everything. This is why the angel says to her, Hail, full of grace, in Luke's gospel. So we know she's not the most defiled woman. She, we know she's not the most average woman. She's the most pure woman. She's the most holy woman. And it's fitting. It's proper. It's decent. Because this is the woman, this is the person chosen by God to enter into our world. Yes, he comes. He dies for sinners. He dies a gruesome death on the cross for our redemption. He rises on the third day. He dines with sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors. Yes, that's all true. But when we talk about the ontological, metaphysical entry of the Son of God into human history and partaking of our human nature, that amazing partaking of the human nature. He had to take the human nature. He assumes partakes of the human nature by one person, one person alone, and that is the Blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus. Father uh, Donald Calloway, Calloway, yeah, Calloway, yeah. He talks about, and other doctors have talked about it, that during pregnancy, cells from the baby pass into the mother and become part of her composition. And years later, if she becomes sick, there's a problem. Those cells of that baby that are left there from that pregnancy, whether the baby went to term or not, fight and help the mother, her immune system. There's a, there's a, there's an inner connection between the child in the mother's womb and the mother. There's also a sharing of blood. So the blood of Jesus Christ was moving about in the Blessed Virgin Mary. Why would she be a vile sinner or an average woman? The cells of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, 
remained in the Virgin Mary in some way her entire life. That's beautiful. Hit the like button if you like it. So today's podcast was not to get all theological. Today's podcast was just, let's just do common sense. Common sense tells you that the mother of Jesus would be all pure and all holy because Jesus is all pure and all holy, and he would enter into humanity, into history, by honoring a holy mother. Remember, Ten Commandments, honor thy father and mother. How else could Jesus honor his mother than to grant her the most perfect salvation ever given to a person? He gives her the most perfect justification from the first instant, the most perfect sanctification from the first instant, the most perfect regeneration from the first instant, the most perfect indwelling of the Holy Spirit from the very first instant. You honor your mother, you honor your father. Jesus honored his mother. It's just a fact. And I really don't think it would take a magisterium, a pope, scholastic arguments, debates to convince people of goodwill. As long as they believe Jesus is fully God, fully man, and that he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, what we say in the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed, as long as people will believe that, and that's all Protestants, all Orthodox, once you accept that, it is just common sense, perfect sense, that the mother of Jesus would be the most holy person that ever lived. Period. Close the book. All right, time for your questions and comments. I'm going to go in and see what you guys are saying. Happy Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And going in to see what you guys have to say. Lots of good comments here. You must be born again. We agree. You must be. Here's a Vicky. Vicky says, I don't mean to be harsh, but you are believing a lie taught by men. Mary has never heard a single prayer. Well, Vicky, what you just said is not in the Bible. So I'm assuming you're a Protestant, and I'm assuming you only believe in what's written in the Bible. And by the way, only believe what's written in the Bible is not written in the Bible. So it's, it's a tradition of man. It's not actually biblical teaching. But we do know that we are to ask one another for prayers. Vicki, you could ask me right now for me to pray for you or your mother or your father, and I would do that. And I would pray to Jesus. More accurately, to God the Father, through Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, is how Catholics understand it. But we also believe that below that Trinitarian intercession is a whole community called the church. And in the church, we're always praying for each other. So I'm praying for my kids. I went to Mass today, and I prayed for all my kids, prayed for my wife, prayed for people in my life, people who have asked for prayers. And I offered all those prayers to the Father through Jesus Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible tells us to do. And Vicki, I just don't believe, and it doesn't make sense. I think, if Vicki, if you honestly pray about it and you think about it, it doesn't make sense that when the Virgin Mary went to heaven, she was just like, well, done with all those people down on earth. I'm not praying anymore for them. Done. Checked out. It just doesn't make any sense, Vicki, that the people in heaven are checked out and aren't praying for us anymore. They were praying for us fervently in this life. And you're trying to tell me when they go to heaven, they're no longer, they can no longer see us. They can no longer pray for us. That just doesn't make sense. And Vicki, I think if you go and read the earliest church fathers, the Christians right after the apostles, you'll realize that all of them were seeking the intercession of saints. All of them were keeping and venerating relics of the saints. They made icons and images of the saints. Go into the catacombs, Vicki, where the early church was having worship, Eucharist. You'll see that they're making pictures of Jesus, but they're also making pictures of Mary and the saints because they believe, as Hebrews says, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And so, Vicki, I would ask you, do you believe that you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses that are of people that are in heaven? 
If you're a Bible believer, you have to say yes. And if you say yes, right now, all around me is a great cloud of witnesses of saints. And I believe that they're praying for me to the Father through Jesus and the unity of the Holy Spirit. That's biblical. That's historical. That's traditional. That's the church fathers. And the Protestants confront us on that every single time, and they lose every single time. Vicki, your claim here is not in the Bible, and it is contradicted by all the early Christians. And I would just encourage you, and I encourage everybody watching right now, pray for Vicki, that she comes to see the true biblical, historical, traditional understanding of the doctrine of the communion of the saints. Because our communion with our brothers and sisters in Christ does not stop at death. In fact, it gets stronger. That's the Catholic teaching. So thanks for watching, Vicki, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about the communion of the saints. See, we can have discussions here and be kind and bring light to things. It's good. And uh, I like this right here. Clea says, let's pray for Vicky, y'all. Amen. Uh, John says, pray to Mary consistently. She hears. That's correct. Every person in heaven can see us, knows what's going on in the world. How do they know this? Are they gods? No, they're connected to God. Every person in heaven has what's called the beatific vision. That means they're looking, they have a vision that's blessed, that's looking into the divine essence of God. We can't, we're, our finite minds cannot even comprehend it or even really understand it. So every person in heaven is, is connected by this blessed vision of the divine essence. They see God. They see the divine essence. They, they perceive the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this makes them perfectly happy. And because they have that vision of God, their intellect, their souls are elevated to the millionth degree. All right, so you think Thomas Aquinas was smart in the 1270s. Well, Thomas Aquinas tapped into the divine essence with the beatific vision is now a million times. His mind is a, more, a million times more elevated. He is transformed. He is renewed. He is, as St. Paul says, conformed to Christ. So, Paul or John or Peter or Mary Magdalene, their love for the church on earth, their love for their brothers and sisters in Christ goes up a millionfold when they reach heaven. They are, like Jesus Christ, our king and our priest, concerned about the church on earth. They want people to be saved like Jesus wants people to be saved. They are praying before the throne of God. Don't believe me? Go read Revelation chapter 5, and you'll see that that's what, exactly what's going on. Humans and angels are praying before the Lamb of God, before the throne of the Father. You see, Jesus is the high priest. He's the mediator between God and man, but he invites his church to intercede for one another. Otherwise, the Bible would say, never pray for anyone else. That's only for Jesus to do. Only Jesus does inter any interceding. If you tell your mom, I'll pray for you, mom, you're trying to be Jesus. That's bad. Don't ever do that. No, the Bible says we pray for one another. We partake in intercession for one another under Jesus Christ. He's the mediator. But we still can pray for one another all to the Father through Jesus in the unity of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, not only do the saints in heaven have the beatific vision, we're all lassoed together, to use a Texas term, we're all lassoed together with the Holy Spirit, third person, the Trinity, who's connecting us and indwelling us. And people say, well, how could the, how could the Virgin Mary hear so many things at one time? It's like, you're trying to tell me that AT&T and Verizon 
can send text messages and emojis and GIFs and videos and all this stuff into your phone all day long. And you're communicating with people on different continents with voice and text and all that. You're trying to tell me Verizon and AT&T can do it, but God and the, the Holy Ghost can't do it? If I send a text to St. Paul, Holy Ghost can't do it. But I can send a text to my brother and he'll get it instantly and come back to me? Come on. Let's just be reasonable. Be reasonable. Have some common sense. All right, heading back into your comments and questions on this blessed Immaculate Conception. Make sure you share this video. You are my algorithm. And make sure you like the video and you subscribe. Appreciate all y'all. Kelvin Crafton watching over on Facebook says, you're right. Theology cannot support your position. Kelvin, I don't know what you're talking about because the majority of Christians, the majority of theologians all agree that Mary is sinless. Go read the church fathers. Go read all the, every theologian who defended the Trinity, defended the divinity of Christ. All of those people believe Mary never sinned, that she was the most holy person in the Greek church. They call her the, the Panagia or Panagia. Pan means all, Agia means holy, holiness. She is the all holiness because she's the mother of God. So, Kelvin, I don't know where you're coming from on that. But just use common sense, read the church fathers, think about it, think about who God is, and uh, you'll come to see the truth. And we're praying for you. Magda says, how can someone live without her in their lives? They don't know what they're missing. Ah, oh, Magda, I agree. I used to be a Protestant. And I always, there was a time in my life where I was like, oh, Mary is a threat. People worship Mary, not Jesus. But then after you've met some Catholics and you've thought about it for a while, you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. Like, I can, you know, be friends with someone and really like them and also be friends and really like their parents. There's not like a competition there. In fact, it actually probably deepens a relationship. But I will say that being a Catholic and having the Blessed Virgin Mary in my life makes me love Jesus more. In Luke, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. So I believe Mary is the magnifying glass. If you look at Mary, it magnifies who Jesus is. I also think praying the rosary and praying the Hail Mary and looking at beautiful images of the Virgin Mary, or especially her holding the Christ child, all of those things keep you from sinning. Hear me out. When, when you think about the Virgin Mary, like she's the mother of Jesus, and she's surrounding you with the great cloud of witnesses. She's watching your life. It's not just like you're disappointing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're dis disappointing Mary and St. Michael, the Archangel, and Peter and Paul. Like, you know, you're inspired to be holy. And it's not just the inspiration. We believe that Mary, you know, Christ is the head of the church. Mary is the neck. She is literally the DNA, the human nature that connects us to Jesus, the head. He's the head. She's the neck. We're the body. Literally, so many graces and beautiful gifts flow through Mary. Ecclesiastes chapter 24 kind of refers to her as a channel or an aqueduct. Later theologians will call her a mediatrix, a mediatrix of graces, all graces even. That's a beautiful thing. So I could never go back. I can't imagine having a relationship and knowing Jesus Christ and praying without there being a Marian element. I think it, for me it would be impossible at this point. And also I would, for people watching and thinking that's crazy, go watch Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. Go watch that film. And you get to the scene where Jesus falls under the cross and Mary runs to him. She's like, my son, my son. And he looks at her. And then watch the scene 
where he's being whipped and they show the Blessed Virgin Mary. And then watch the scene where he's nailed to the cross and they show the Virgin Mary. All that's biblical. Ask yourself, what role is she playing there? And if I were to comfort Jesus while he carried the cross, or if I were to comfort Jesus when he's getting whipped, or if I were to comfort Jesus when he was on the cross, would I not be standing next to the Virgin Mary? And doesn't that mean something? I mean, the Protestants can come into the chat and be cavalier. and oh, She's just an average woman. She's just like everyone else. But it's just not. It, it, anyone who thinks more than four minutes about it realizes that that's not true. All right, back into your comments and into your question. Betty says, Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Mary, our Blessed Mother, said, Do whatever he tells you. Very simple and direct. He, Jesus, is the Son of God. Jesus is God, and Mary is his mother. Is a gift given to us at the cross. Mary does magnify our Lord, and we honor her for that. Exactly. You know, it's all about Jesus, and Mary magnifies Jesus. And what does she tell us in the Bible? Do whatever he tells you to do. Okay. Why are people upset about the Blessed Virgin Mary? It doesn't make sense. Again, just think about it for more than five minutes, and all of this makes sense. Daryl says, or asks, O oh Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us who have recourse to thee. Can someone explain that to me, what this prayer is saying? So that's the prayer on the miraculous medal. I wear it here. So let's break it down. Oh, Mary, that's her name, conceived without sin. So we believe that Jesus saved her at the moment of her conception. That's called the Immaculate Conception. Macula in Latin means a stain. Like, oh, I got a macula on my shirt. Or if you have macular degeneration in your eyes, you have stains in your eyes. Immaculate, immaculata in Latin means not stained. So the word immaculate doesn't mean miraculous. Some people think that. Immaculate means not stained. So, O Mary, conceived without sin. So when she was conceived in her parent, with her by her parents in her mother's womb, her mother's name was Anna or Anne, she did not have original sin. Whereas you and I did get original sin, we were conceived. Pray for us who have recourse to thee. So anyone who is baptized and seeking salvation. Turning to Jesus Christ has recourse to her. Why? Because she stands at the foot of the cross. So if you are seeking salvation, if you are placing your faith in Jesus Christ, you have recourse to her. So we're just saying, Mary, you are conceived without sin. You are privileged. You are full of grace. Pray for us. Good question, Daryl. Thanks for that. Thanks for watching over there on Facebook. All right, back into your comments and into your questions. Howdy, do cowgirl says it's blasphemous to attack Holy Mary, Mother of God. Amen. Totally satanic. Totally satanic. And that's why it's not really reasonable. It's actually demonic. Father Chad Ripperger, the famous exorcist, says that demons recoil at the Virgin Mary more than they recoil to Christ. Now, they know Christ is the Son of God, and they know Mary is not a goddess. She's a human person without sin. And you ask Father Rivergo, why are demons more offended by the Virgin Mary than they are by Jesus? And it, it's this. The demons, all the demons fell through the sin of pride. They didn't fall through sodomy or stealing money. 100% of the demons that once were angels that fell and became demons, they all fell because of pride. So the sin that infects them most deeply is pride. They know who God is. They know that God exists. They know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They know that Jesus Christ, the second person in Trinity, has authority as God to punish them and to send them to hell. They know that's the fact. What they don't like is that while Satan deceived Eve, God sent a new Eve, the Virgin Mary, who loved God, believed in God, hoped in God perfectly, and was the means by which Jesus entered the world and defeated him. He is humiliated that a woman who was not divine was the means by which he lost it all. And as a prideful agent, that is what stings him the most. 
You might even ask, why would God even do this whole Virgin Mary thing? Part of it, in his wisdom, is the complete humiliation of Satan and all the demons. Also, as Catholics, we believe that Lucifer, who was who became Satan, had the highest seat or the highest place in proximity to God, and he lost that place through his pride. And now the highest seat under Jesus Christ, who sits at the right hand of the Father, is his mother. He honors his mother. So Satan really hates that he was number two to God, and now he's no longer, he's in hell, and now number two to God is a woman. His pride hates that. Going back in your comments and questions, lots of good comments in here. This is Amy. Mary's womb is immaculate. She is, was, without sin, the original sin of Adam and Eve. Mary said yes to God, to his messenger, the angel Gabriel, who will come again to announce the second coming of Christ. Amy, you're 100% correct. You are a strong, good Catholic. You know your faith. That's right. She is and was without sin. And her womb is immaculate. Think if you, if, if someone said to you, hey, in seven days time, Jesus is going to come to your house. You got seven days to prepare. Would you do anything to the, to where, to, let's say he's going to come stay at, at a bedroom in your house. Would you do anything to that bedroom? W would you leave, you know, beer cans and stains on the rug and dirty sheets and cockroaches and, you know, peeling paint and, you know, the toilet unflushed for when Jesus came to visit you? No. You would prepare to the best of your ability an abode fitting for God, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You wouldn't have beer cans on the ground, stained yellow sheets. If you did, you got problems. You would, you would prepare the best you possibly could. And that's as Catholics all were saying, that when God was going to enter into the world, yes, he chose humility when it came to money. Remember, God doesn't care that much about money. And so he was born into poverty, not even into a real house. But when it comes to the metaphysical, ontological, personal connection of the second person Trinity to humanity, that portal is the womb of the Virgin Mary. Yeah, but Taylor, how do you even know that the womb is all? The Bible says, blessed is the fruit of thy womb. For that blessed art thou amongst women. Who's the most blessed woman ever? Mary. How do you know? Bible says so. Also talks about her womb. Her womb is immaculate. God prepared it that way. Heading back to your comments. Let's just make, I mean, can I just get an amen from y'all? Doesn't this just make sense? Like, it's common sense. A child, an eight-year-old child could understand that the mother of the Messiah, the mother of the Son of God, is going to be special is going to be full of grace and united to the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's just basic, basic. Dave says, so the womb was sinless, not Mary. Okay, so wombs can't sin, technically, right? People sin, right? So Mary's person, and persons are body and soul, connection to body, soul. Mary's body and soul were not tainted by sin. You can say, you know, if you commit lots of sin with your hand, you can say, my hand is sinful. And the Bible talks about I have a sinful mouth or sinful eyes, right? That's common in the Bible. That means you've used these, these members, these parts of your body to commit sin, right? It's, it's, your, it's your intellect and your will. It's your soul that does it. 
but you're sort of corrupting your body parts by the way you sin. That's a biblical way of talking. Every cell of the Blessed Virgin Mary was pure and immaculate, was never corrupted by any sin. She never looked at anyone in a sinful way, in a lustful way, in a contemptible way, in a jealous way. Her eyes never did that. Her ears, everything about her was completely graceful, by which I mean full of grace. So Mary's body and her soul were perfectly sinless. And this is why at the end of her life, after the Dormition, her body and her soul were lifted up and assumed in heaven. And again, that just makes sense too. That's just, you know, spend five minutes thinking about it just makes sense. So happy Feast of the Immaculate Conception. It's been great talking with y'all. Thanks for your comments and questions. Make sure you like this video, subscribe. Got a lot of big news coming out next week about my new book, Nikolaus. Um, also, I have a calendar that will be coming out. It's a traditional Catholic calendar, and it has the 1962 and the pre-55 all in one beautiful wall calendar that's going to hang in your kitchen when you get a copy of it. And if you use my favorite missile, the Father Lassance missile, which I'll be giving away soon, um, it works great with the calendar that I've just designed. And I'll be announcing that next week so you can buy one and have it ready for January 1st in your kitchen. You'll have every Saint's Day, 1962, pre-55. It's beautiful. It's everything you need, and it has great, beautiful art. You're going to love it. So lots of good stuff coming out. So make sure you are subscribed so that you get all those updates. Also yesterday, great interview with Dr. Dan Schneider, who does a lot of the exorcism I guess you could call it triage with Father Chad Ripperger. Uh, please watch that uh, interview yesterday. It's very powerful. It's called The Top Five Sins That Lead to Possession. This is actual research on the five sins that lead people to be possessed. So you want to know about that. Don't want to commit those sins. So go to yesterday's show and watch Dr. Dan Schneider and I talk about the top five sins leading to possession. And we're going to close up with a prayer to Our Lady. We'll pray the Hail Mary in Latin. Oremus. Nomine Patris et Filii, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et ora mortis nostre, Amen. O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Saint Joseph, terror of demons, pray for us. Nomine Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Thanks for watching, and remember our Lord Jesus Christ is you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless and Godspeed.